We'd like to welcome you all to the spring 2023 semester of the Modern Tibetan Studies program at Columbia University and Happy New Year. My name is Lauren Hartley and I serve as director of the MTSP centered here in the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Today's event is the first in a five part lecture series entitled Women in Tibetan Studies. I'll just share that uh, poster with you here. The idea to host such a series uh, was that of uh, my colleague, Gray Tuttle, the Layla Hadley Luce Professor of Modern Tibetan Studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. The purpose of this series is to recognize five distinguished women who have contributed to enriching the fields of Tibetan and Himalayan studies through their scholarship, through their professional activity and leadership. We are grateful to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for their financial and logistic support, which makes possible this online talk and our four upcoming hybrid events with in-person attendance and online viewing. It's exciting to note that more than 200 people worldwide have registered for today's talk. I would like to personally welcome all of you who are on the call and especially our guest speaker, Professor Yudrit Somu. After Professor Tsoma speaks, we invite you to type any questions in the Zoom Q&A box below. So you won't use the chat, you'll use the Q&A box. I also thank Professor Tuttle, who will moderate the discussion and now introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Weatherhead, for sponsoring this and for Yudrit Tsoma for coming. I am very grateful to call Yudrit Tsoma my dear friend for almost a quarter century now. <laughs> And uh, I welcome her from the Center for Tibetan Studies at Sichuan University. Uh, you'll know her work, uh, her published work based on her dissertation at Harvard, uh, The Rise of Gompo Namgyal, uh, The Blind Warrior of Kham, and also for her important work since that time on the Guozhuang as female in intermediaries in the tea trade in uh, Darce Do, uh, negotiating between Chinese and, and Tibetan merchants and monasteries. Um, so I'm very excited to have Yudra Zomo here today to launch this talk. She is possibly the, the first Tibetan woman to get a PhD, certainly the first woman in, in Tibetan studies to get a PhD in the West. And so it seemed very fitting to have her launch this series. So now I turn it over to you, Tomo. Thank you. Good morning. and. Uh, um... First, thank Gray for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank both Gray and Laurie and Julia for uh, making this event uh, happen. And uh, it's my pleasure to start uh, this series. And the title of my talk is Seven, Seven Star Lamas Resident in Kham, Gata Monasteries Interactions with Indigenous Chiefs and the uh, Qin Court. And, so it's a pleasure to share uh, my recent um, study with you. Um, first of all, um, let's look where the Gata Monastery is, and then um, uh, I'll talk about um, what sources I use, what questions I address. Um, the Gata Monastery, uh, you can see here, uh, a Gata. Now it's uh, it is located uh, in the present day uh, Dawu County. Uh, it's called the uh, Shidi Township in Dawu County. Uh, as you can see, which is now very far from Da uh, Zendo uh, in Chinese counting or Da Jianlu. And it's, uh, um, it's a historical uh, town uh, where the monastery uh, is located uh, since, at least since uh, 13th uh, century. So, um, this monastery was especially uh, built for the seventh Dalai Lama Gesang Jiazhu by the Qing court uh, in, in 1730. He lived there for over five years. And uh, later, the uh, 11th Dalai Lama uh, Kedru Jiazhu was born in a village near the monastery, uh, which became uh, well known in both Kham and Central Tibet. So throughout the, uh, its history, the uh, monastery had been greatly valued and supported by both the Qing court and the uh, Tibetan government. Um, uh, however, uh, very little uh, scholarly attention has been paid 
uh, to uh, both the seven Dalai Lama's um, influence income in light of his residence in Gata Monastery or how the monastery uh, was uh, established. And so uh, to date, if you look at the uh, li uh, literature about the Seventh Dalai Lama, you will see that most of the literature actually focused on, has focused on his activities uh, in central Tibet. So little attention paid to his uh, stay in Gata. And um, there, there have not, has not been much discussion uh, about his interactions uh, with the indigenous leaders, or indigenous chiefs in the region. Uh, also, in particularly, uh, very little uh, research in English devoted to the history of the uh, Gata Monastery uh, itself. Uh, also neglected uh, has been Gata's influence in Kham after uh, the seventh Dalai Lama left for central Tibet in 1735. As I will show that it has always been a very important um, uh, center of uh, Buddhism, uh, as well as culture and the religious center up until maybe um, end of the uh, Republican period. Uh, so uh, let's see, uh, in, in it's, it's a very detailed article and questions uh, to be addressed in, in this paper, uh, have uh, six of them here. So at a very crucial period in Tibetan history, um, turbulent uh, politics forced uh, removal of the uh, six Dalai Lama. And then uh, we'll, I in the paper, I discuss why did the Qing court decide to have the seventh Dalai Lama move to Gata in Chinese timing, um, um, Gata region in the 1730s, um, and then second part of my paper, I discussed why did the chain choose Gata Monastery to be his resident monastery. Uh, and, and then the third part is very detailed uh, because of the time constraint. I won't be able to probably go very much into it except to highlight some of the um, special or unique features is how was the monastery constructed? How did Gata relate to other local monasteries and indigenous chiefs uh, in the neighboring areas? And then fourth one, um, uh, I specifically, uh, I especially focus on after the 17th, uh, seventh Dalai Lama left Gata, why did the Qing court actually prohibited um, uh, Gata monastery monks from propagating the Gelu teaching in Chuqing in Chinese in Jingchuan and Zanha um, in Xiaojing after these two regions were, were pacified by the Qing in 1776. Uh, and then um, the next part uh, in my paper, I look at the role of Gata Monastery in the local affairs of the Kham after the Seventh Dalai Lama left in 1735. Uh, uh, especially what was the role of the Gata Monastery in obstructing Han Chinese traders from engaging in gold mining in Gata in 1905. Um, so these are the questions I uh, have explored in my paper, uh, but in the talk, I will uh, pick uh, and uh, focus on more of his interaction with the indigenous chiefs and monasteries. Uh, then let's look at, um, what sources, uh, just very briefly, yeah. Um, the sources, the Tibetan primary sources are mainly used for this study is the biographies of, uh, the biography of the seventh Dalai Lama by Janja Robidoji, and then um, supplemented with the biography of Gandan Shri Rinpoche, uh, Ach Aritu Nomenhain, who was the tutor of the seventh Dalai Lama. And furthermore, as you can see, um, I also look at the biography of Janja Robodoji by uh, Tukun Chuchinima, the biography of uh, Draya Chitsang, uh, Lo Sam Nangje, um, and then also the uh, successive abbots of the Changdu Changpani, uh, et cetera. So um, in addition to the biography itself, I, I supplement with other uh, Tibetan sources to allow me to do uh, research. Uh, for the Chinese one, um, 
mainly uh, Qing Shulu, the relevant records in Qing vertebral records. And then I also used, I only list the main ones, uh, a general history of Tibet, the general history of wisdom, uh, where um, I can find uh, information of the Chinese officials traveling through the region, uh, their description, and then um, one of the most important uh, first primary uh, source is um, diary of my Tibet trip or my Tibetan trip uh, by Prince uh, Go uh, Yongli, who was uh, sent by the uh, by the emperor to escort um, <clears throat> the seventh Dalai Lama uh, back to uh, to send him off back to central Tibet together with the Janja Hutukatu. So he uh, his diary has a very detailed account of. Uh, his stay with the Dalai Lama uh, in Gata Monastery and also description of uh, the surrounding area, a nice description of the uh, monastery. And then um, I also use the inscription of the uh, Gata Monastery um, and may, um, made uh, by a per imperial order. Uh, there we can find um, reasons why the emperor um, established the monastery and why he sent the uh, Dalai Lama to uh, in, in exile in the uh, in Kham. And uh, another one is Gazette of Yajo uh, Prefecture. So uh, other uh, Tibetan sources, secondary sources, uh, or mainly uh, in Tibetan secondary sources, uh, uh, I want to uh, single out is one of them, a brief account of origin of Minya uh, Rebga in this book by a very well-known local um, a scholar, Nianshu uh, Jaranadaba. He has a section about, a long section about the Gata Monastery. Um, and the others, um, <clears throat> I uh, try, uh, I have managed to gather together uh, are also secondary source uh, by another author, Droma Chunzo, uh, about the Gata Monastery. And then um, in when I in, uh, discuss the uh, monasteries' relationship with other monasteries, uh, I've used some of the history of uh, Gekha Monastery in Minya, history of uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Gunu Monastery uh, also in Minya, uh, in one of the uh, books called the History of Monastery in Ganze. And these are also supplemented by various folk stories collected in the region. And so and that's the sources I use. Uh, and so um, for, then I'll turn to the first part, um, uh, discussing the historical background for the Seventh Dalai Lama's exile uh, in Gata. I, um, I assume most of my audience probably are familiar uh, with the background. So I'll be brief here is um, we need to trace back to the internal strife in central uh, Tibet uh, in early 18th century. So in order to drive out the Dzungars in Tibet, in 1720, Emperor Kangxi formally conferred the title of Dalai Lama um, um, and the uh, um, reincarnated uh, boy born in Litang and has his son, um, Prince Yongti, escort the reincarnation to Lhasa, where, where he was enthroned at the uh, Budala Palace. Um, and so after the uh, Dungas uh, were driven out in 1723, so the Qing court uh, appointed five Galun uh, ministers headed by Kanchine Sonan uh, um, to be jointly in charge of the Tibetan uh, government. Um, but when you look at, at the time, these ministers were actually divided into three factions I list here. The very first one is the lay aristocratic faction of Zhang, represented by uh, Kamchine Sonan Jebo and Polane um, <clears throat> Sonam Dobje. And then second group is the lay aristocratic faction of Wu, um, yeah. represented by Ngapuiba Doji Jebo and uh, Lumbawa Jashi Jebo. The third faction uh, we can tentatively referred to as the Dalai Lama faction by uh, Jarawa uh, Lodru Jebu. So in August 1727, Ngapipa, uh, uh, Lumbawa, and uh, Jarawa, the second group and third group of the faction I list uh, on the screen, 
they uh, killed or they assassinated the um, uh, company, and thereupon the war between Wu and Zhang uh, broke out. So when Polanyi led his troops uh, on a, a punitive uh, expedition against Ngapiba, the Qing court uh, supported him. After the internal strife was pacified, the Qing court conferred the title of Beizi, Prince of the Fourth Rank on Polanyi, and place him in charge of the political affairs of Tibet. So that's the background um, uh, when uh, Dalai Lama actually uh, uh, went into exile uh, later in 1728. So if we look at the reasons uh, for uh, the Qing court um, uh, to move the Dalai Lama to come, uh, we can point to uh, three uh, major reasons. The very first one uh, we'll say is the Dungar Mongols um, uh, factor. Say they are as a major uh, danger lurking in the background. They uh, they always pose a threat in central Tibet, and this caused the Qing court to be very anxious uh, about a possible further uh, Dungar invasion of uh, Tibet. So. Uh, transferring the Dalai Lama to come uh, would take him far away from the danger posed by the Dungar Mongols and secure him um, firmly under the control of the Qing court. And so um, another uh, reason is as one of the measures taken by the Qing court to deal with the aftermath uh, of the 1727 internal uh, struggles, in Tibet, sending the Dalai Lama uh, to, into exile paved the way for Polhane Sonam Dobji uh, to take charge of Stepani affair. This was because during <clears throat> the war between the uh, Wu and Zhang, the seventh Dalai Lama's uh, father, Sonam Daji, also became uh, very much uh, involved. Um, and so um, he himself uh, was originally from Chumji and Yunwe. And um, because of his relationship with uh, the lay aristocrat um, uh, ministers uh, in Wu, uh, he took side of the Wu. Uh, he took Lombawa's daughter as his concubine. That, made, that, will, that would uh, make Lombawa as uh, his father-in-law. And he was the maternal uncle of Ngapiba. So um, uh, it proved very natural for him to ally with Ngapipa and his faction. So um, from the readings, sources I have, uh, we can tell he was con considered to be the mastermind behind uh, the scenes in the struggle. And so the nobles from Wu uh, believed him to be a, a, a serious interference in the government affairs of, uh, 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 of Tibet. Uh, some actually uh, should be um, okay, and so the other reason, the third reason, I think uh, I don't need to say speak too much, except we can really see the real purpose uh, motivating Emperor Yongzheng to send the Dalai Lama into exile is very clearly revealed um, uh, in the Chinese inscription of a Gata Monastery uh, made by the Imperial Order, which uh, stood still stood. Uh, nowadays, um, still in the courtyard of the monastery, and which read as follows. Um, so, finally, refer to local Tibetans in the nearby regions are far away from Tibet and all set their mind on taking refuge with Buddhism. Uh, what is spreading the Gelu teachings since Buddhism is conducive to the imperial dynasty's enlightenment of the local people? It is indeed beneficial. This is a partial translation of the inscription. So the statement in uh, this inscription shows that uh, one of the reasons um, uh, for the Emperor Yongzheng to have the Dalai Lama uh, <clears throat> move to Gata um, was for him to propagate uh, Buddhism among the local people so as to uh, facilitate the Qing court's effort to enlighten the local uh, people. I think this is Nothing new. Uh, we have uh, read quite a lot about um, uh, having the Geluba or having the Buddhist uh, masters 
to propagate uh, so as to enlighten the local people, uh, like the case in Yarung. Uh, after the Gombonanji was defeated, uh, they established monasteries, Kelu monasteries there. Uh, there. And so, um, but this also uh, sentiment is also reflected in one of the edicts uh, uh, issued by the emperor ordering the Qing troops um, uh, to be stationed in Yili town to protect and support Garta. And the edict says, if Buddhism is to be revived and invigorated, the monks in the Western frontier uh, will be uh, will all obtain uh, uh, reverence and compassion, uh, claiming to seek liberation. These monks will seize their uh, intention to cure and they will generate goodwill uh, uh, and thereby the frontier will, for a long period of time, enjoy the blessing of the peace granted by the emperor so that we can live up to the intention of the Shenzhou, the compassionate uh, uh, emperor. I refer to the emperor Kangxi to draw over people from afar and to be compassionate uh, to them. And so you can see that this shows uh, the uh, third reason uh, to have him in come to uh, enlighten the people. Oh, okay, so uh, next I'll turn to saying why um, actually before they chose uh, Gata as his residence, they temporarily chose Li Tang as a temporary site in Kham for the seventh Dalai Lama. And so um, he stayed uh, in Li Tang uh, temporarily from February 1729 to January uh, 1730, uh, 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 about a year uh, in Li Tang. And so um, when you look into the reasons or the uh, rationale behind it, uh, you would see that um, Li Tang would fulfill, uh, uh, would, would be an ideal uh, site uh, for him to uh, stay temporarily uh, while they wait for the Gata Monastery to be constructed. Uh, the very first one is, of course, is Li Tang was also, also similar to Gata, very far from Lhasa, and resetting the Dalai Lama there uh, would clearly achieve the Qing court's purpose of not involving him or his father in Tibetan, uh, in, in Tibetan political stru uh, struggle. This would also place the Dalai Lama far away from the uh, Jungars. Um, uh, second, uh, second reason is by that time, um, Li Tang already placed under the, the, the jurisdiction of Sichuan province and was close to Chengdu, the provincial capital. And so that Sichuan troops could effectively uh, protect the Dalai Lama in addition to the troops stationed uh, in the area uh, right after the uh, Qing expedition against the Zungars uh, in around seven. Uh, 1719 to 1720. And third reason, it's very natural. Li Tang was the seventh Dalai Lama's hometown, and therefore it's, it was natural for him to stay there uh, temporarily. Uh, but soon they moved to Gata. So I would like to show you why they chose Gata, uh, what's the uh, um, advantages of Gata over uh, Li Tang. So for Gata, um, they selected as a site uh, for uh, for the monastery to be built. And if you look into the history of the uh, town, uh, uh, Gata or Gata town, uh, you will see that it had it has uh, it had already been a, a very ancient town with a long history. So um, according to the local uh, legend, um, it, it actually. Uh, trace back all the way to the uh, um, 7th uh, century, to the town period, according to the local legend, when Sun Zhang Gambu's minister, there were no minister, Ga Dong Zhan returned to Tibet from town capital in the mid 7th century. He was finally able to escape um, pursuing town troops by reaching this uh, region. And so this area, it's called Gata, in Tibetan literally mean the place where Gadong then escaped. Um, so these are the uh, sources I have for the folklore about uh, trace the origin um, uh, way back to the seventh uh, century. Um, but in fact, we can only uh, trace the uh, 
rec uh, recorded history of the region back to 1265 uh, uh, when the Yuan court established Gata, uh, Gata in Chinese, Hada or Shada or Heda, different uh, names uh, for the town to uh, strengthen its regional military uh, ex uh, presence. Uh, for those of you who are familiar uh, with the Yuan history, um, you would recall that uh, Kublai Khan actually um, led his troops travel through part of Kham and into the Dali um, uh, uh, area. And so uh, um, in 1265, they established uh, this town uh, to strengthen the, uh, its regional military presence. Um, so um, Gata's uh, strategic position made it the seat of, in Chinese called Dogan Siha Da Li Tang, Yu Tong Deng Chu Qian Liang Zhong Guan Fu. And so um, uh, it's the supervisory uh, office um, uh, in charge of, uh, here is missing, in charge of the uh, military uh, provisions in Li Tang, uh, Yu Tong, uh, Gu Tang, and other places. And so um, you can see that in 1274, uh, they transferred soldiers from Diaomen, uh, nowadays uh, Tian Chuan County, and not very far from the uh, uh, Chengdu um, to the west and to garrison there. In 1276, a further 500 soldiers were dispatched to garrison the Gata uh, to increase the power of the local uh, administrative organ. In the same year, the Yuan court elevated Gata town to be Ningyuan sub-prefecture. So you can see why the 13th century uh, Gata, um, um, Gata town um, had already enjoyed the status of a strong military, uh, uh, military uh, or strategic town. Uh, um, so, um, and so I'm not going to go detail, but uh, you can see the uh, in during the uh, mean period, um, the the, uh, the town of um, Gata developed further. Um, when you look at the Gata, um, and the map, um, I didn't go into detail. It was located on the forked road uh, along the ancient two horse trade routes formed in the mean period, uh, two routes. Uh, and so uh, one, uh, we're more familiar with the Southern route and Northern route. So uh, back then they all uh, need to, uh, at least the Northern route pass through the area. So it became a vital hub uh, controlling uh, in, in, in Chinese uh, vital hub, controlling access to various uh, Tibetan regions. Um, so Gata was uh, also close to uh, Li Tang along the southern uh, Sichuan Tibetan trade route and Dazendo, and uh, also um, functioned um, as, as the transition uh, station connecting its southern and northern Sichuan Tibetan trade routes. So eventually during the uh, mean period, it developed into a major trading center along the uh, northern um, uh, trade route. Um, and so uh, especially in uh, 1724, when the rebellion led by the Kushkai's grandson, Lo Sam Danjin, the uh, Koshot uh, prince reached no uh, northern Kham and the famous Nian Geng Yao, the general Nian Geng Yao, uh, was ordered to suppress it. So at that time, he had uh, massive um, forces um, uh, garrisoned at Garta. The next year, uh, Sichuan governor um, uh, Wang Jinghao ordered construction of the earthen town of um, uh, Garta based on the original plan and the building of the barracks. So, um, with, so you can see um, with the natural river, the Yalongjiang, as its natural cover for defense, Gata could reinforce its advantageous position within the three ferry stations of Nyachu and not very far uh, in uh, present day uh, Nyachu County, uh, Yajiang County. So um, compared with uh, Li Tang, you would have further um, uh, defense uh, like, uh, 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 advantage. And also uh, the Gata compared with Li Tang, as you know, in, in locate, it's located in a lower altitude and uh, um, its open terrain also suited the uh, garrison of uh, massive forces. Um, and also even now uh, it's famous for being um, the um, 
binary or green uh, base for the come. So uh, with fertile uh, land, so it would be possible for um, uh, for the uh, for the locally produced uh, uh, grain and all the goods to support uh, large uh, bodyguard force uh, for the seventh Dalai Lama. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, compared with uh, uh, Li Tang Gata, fulfill the ideal place to provide a safe haven for the uh, Dalai Lama. And so um, next, I'll go very briefly. Um, in, in Dalai Lama, in the seventh Dalai Lama's biography, uh, there are description, vivid description of how the site was uh, selected uh, in um, 1729. So according to the local uh, legend, a Chinese geomancy master and an eminent Tibetan diviner both identified the place where the monastery was to be built as a treasured site of a, a good uh, uh, geoma uh, geomantic omens. And so, um, and then in, in the Seventh Star Lama's uh, biography, the site of the Gauta Monastery was praised as an auspicious and perfect uh, holy land uh, by, um, uh, by Ajanja Rubidoji. And locally, it was known uh, as treasure land uh, of the Lotus and a shrine known as Galadze. Um, where the Gar family made offerings to deities also stood uh, nearby. So the, to the east, uh, one could also find the ruins of a large monastery and the hermitage cave of uh, supposed uh, to be the uh, uh, cave for the well-known translator, Berizana or Varachana, so which was uh, actually uh, situated on a spur of the holy mountain Shadragabu. Uh, in Chinese called uh, uh, Yala Xueshan. So um, all these features uh, contribute to the uh, perception of the local people that Gata was virtually a holy land, uh, blessed by eminent and virtuous monks and uh, uh, lamas. Uh, so this is uh, how the uh, site was uh, elect, uh, selected. Um, and so, um, in the biography and other Chinese sources, we can also show the monastery was jointly built by uh, both Tibetan and uh, Han Chinese workers. And so it took them uh, less than two years, about um, yeah, about uh, a year and a half or a little bit more. And so the monastery was modeled on the designed architectural styles of the Jibong Monastery in Lhasa. And uh, we have records to see that the Sutran provincial uh, treasury as Sichuan province uh, administrator, I uh, uh, located, uh, allocated over 80,000 tails of silver in advance and et cetera. So we have a record of saying over 428 people took part in the construction, including Han Chinese from Chengdu, uh, subjects under the indigenous chiefs name and Gao and Yang in Tianquan, and workers of the Jala, uh, Jala King, uh, the Minjin Tusi. Um, it was uh, especially uh, recorded that the Jala King willingly offered uh, his uh, estates in the Gata region to be used to establish uh, not only the monastery, but also the military camps of, uh, for his guards. And so um, I'm not going to uh, go too much uh, detail uh, in the process of the bu uh, building the monastery, except what I want to mention that uh, it's, um, it's a huge monastery and with a total area of over 500 moon. And so the compound of the monastery uh, contains, uh, uh, consists of over 100 rooms in uh, palaces and high buildings and over 400 single story houses. So in, when, in the beginning, when it was built, it's really grand and uh, um, uh, my, uh, the buildings were magnificent and imposing. And so with architectural uh, styles, as you can imagine, um, that combine both Tibetan and Chinese tradition. And so um, um, one thing I want to uh, mention that uh, very specifically about this monastery is um, a screen wall in Chinese called Zhao Bi faced the main entrance and was built 
according to the Chinese customs. And so among all the monastery in Kham, Gata Monastery was probably the only one to have such a wall. So you can see the strong influence there. Um, I'm going to, uh, because of the time constraint, I'm um, probably going to skip a little bit uh, about the uh, layout, except what I want uh, mention is uh, even now, uh, in the courtyard, uh, there are a few inscriptions, a bilingual Mongol Chinese version called Inscription of Gata Monastery made by the uh, Empress Order, which I quoted uh, earlier, and the inscription of Prince Gaul's Order to Gata Monastery in Chinese, erected in 1735, and uh, uh, also the inscription of Prince Gaul's poems. And what uh, I want to point it out uh, in right above the middle section of the main gate of the uh, assembly hall, uh, there were uh, nine lines and uh, uh, covered in different shapes and with varying continents to symbolize the Dalai Lama. So, and then in, in the space around the main gate, um, carving of the nine dragon represent the Qin Emperor. So the number uh, nine represents the highest of the uh, positive number that's um, nine dragons and nine lines carved on the main gate embody the exalted status enjoyed by the Gata Monastery. And this is a, a picture of uh, this. I just described the lines and the dragons on the side. So um, I'm going to, uh, next I'm going to really uh, focus on um, the, after the Dalai Lama's residence in Gata, uh, his, interactions with indigenous chiefs and monasteries in Kham. So after he moved, to, uh, he uh, started to reside in Gata Monastery. Uh, Gata itself, the monastery itself became a center of uh, Buddhism. And so uh, in his biography, we saw uh, many descriptions of he taught or wrote on behalf of those who gathered to receive uh, his blessings. And so a great, um, uh, many people did come to study or uh, there or pay homage to the Dalai Lama. And so, for instance, in the biography, um, <clears throat> it described indigenous leaders from Litang, Batang, Dazendo, uh, and the five whole uh, regions in northern Kham, uh, present day uh, Ganzi and uh, uh, Zhanggu, and uh, Ningchang, Washu, Jetang, Jerong, other areas, all arrived at uh, Gata Monastery to pay homage to the Dalai Lama offer uh, him a great amount of valuable presence. So this is just one example. And so did many of the Qing officials, monastic and lay officials from central Tibet, as well as Mongol princes and officials. Uh, uh, you would read a list of uh, people, uh, a whole list of people coming to uh, see him. Um, also, it shows that even though he was in exile in, um, uh, in Kham, he remained very actively involved in religious affairs in Mongol and uh, Tibetan regions. So when the third Tahan Nomahan, a uh, uh, high ranking reincarnate, uh, uh, highly uh, uh, reincarnation, highly revered by Mongols and Tibetans in Qinghai, passed away in 1728, the seventh Dalai Lama performed the rite of salvation for, uh, for the Lama. And so uh, there are many other uh, listing of uh, uh, his uh, association, his intact action with other um, uh, indigenous chiefs and the monasteries. So um, the monasteries I list here, but too many of them um, for me to go through. Uh, practically uh, most of the monasteries, um, um, uh, many, uh, almost many, uh, most of the monasteries, Gelu uh, school monasteries, and there are other uh, such uh, Nima uh, monasteries as well, uh, who sent monks and came to uh, meet him. And then their listing of uh, years, like here, say 1730, 1732, 1734, uh, um, he performed religious rites and distributed alms to monasteries near Litang, Jetang, Minya, and the areas of the five whole. Uh, chiefs in Northern Kham and elsewhere. Um, so um, in his biography, um, there were uh, passages describing that he wrote and determined the territorial limit for some of the monasteries like Gandan, Sunzani, Jetang, uh, Degumbu Temple under the Kansa chief uh, in Ganze, and composed monastic rules for Gandan Nanjene of Jango and the Shuta Monastery of Nashu in 
um, present day not true. So I'm not going to go detail, but you can see uh, he has maintained extensive connection with not only the monasteries, but also the indigenous chiefs. Um, for the indigenous uh, chiefs, what I want to emphasize is two uh, major ones. Um, he all, had always remained very close with the Dege King's family. Dege King and his family, um, the Dege King actually maintained a marriage alliance with two generations of the seventh Dalai Lama's family, and they were treated as uh, close kin. Uh, for example, uh, in, um, in uh, 1732, with the approval of Emperor Yongzhen, the seventh Dalai Lama, as niece, um, <clears throat> Seven Dalai Lama's niece um, married uh, Sona Gongbo, uh, the son of the Dege King Dampa And so in 1756, the Seventh Dalai Lama arranged for his niece, Jashi Wamu, to marry the Dege King Lodru Jiatsu. And so you, you would see that he had maintained with one, uh, with one of, uh, with Dege King's family, one of the major chieftains, four major chieftains in Kham. And the same uh, with the uh, Jala, with the Mingzhen in Chinese, uh, Mingzhen um, uh, Tusi. Um, I think there uh, in his biography, there are many descriptions of uh, his close relationship with the family. Uh, for example, as early as 1712, when um, uh, the family actually uh, sent, uh, the uh, Jala family sent their um, um, chieftain to uh, meet with, uh, uh, to go to the Dege to pay homage to the Dalai Lama before he was actually escorted to uh, Xining and Gombong and later to uh, Central Tibet. And so you, uh, you would have many descriptions of uh, the uh, Jala King's family uh, actually um, travel to, uh, they sent the uh, headman uh, under them uh, to meet with the Dalai Lama. And the, the, in, in the biography, there was a description that the Jala King actually had a Chinese style feast uh, for the Dalai Lama, welcome him, and also uh, present him with uh, lots of uh, presents. And so um, there are others, I'm not going to go detail, but you would see that uh, he, um, uh, not only the Jala King's family, also some of the uh, abbots of the monasteries in, in, in Dazendo, they constantly visited him uh, over the new year. And then they also uh, went to send um, a farewell uh, gifts or presents to him. And then in 1735, when he left, the Jala King's uh, family was among the, those who sent him off to the uh, central Tibet. Uh, so I think I'm going to, uh, um, so um, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, so uh, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah. And so um, next, so if you look at the during Samson Dalai Lama's re relationship with the Qing court during his stay, um, there are many descriptions of the emperor send uh, envoys, send gifts present to him, and um, um, like upon the monastery, when, when the monastery was completed, Emperor Yongzheng actually uh, granted a horizontal board inscribed with the name Hui Yuan Si, literally meaning the monastery of lasting bless and luck in Chinese, autographed by himself. And so uh, many others, uh, so um, many other descriptions of uh, when, um, say, when uh, Emperor uh, uh, Yongzheng was pleased with his activities in, uh, in Gata, he actually uh, bestowed um, he he bestowed he granted his tutor uh, the Ngawang Choden the title of uh, uh, Nomenhai, meaning the uh, benevolent Dharma king, and so uh, he also took very good care of them. We have uh, tons of descriptions of um, uh, sending doctors to take care of them. So I'm not going to uh, go detail. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, okay. I'm going to skip this one. So I'll move to saying uh, what happened when, and um, so after Dalai Lama, um, oh, I'm running out of time, yeah. Um, after the Dalai Lama left uh, Central Tibet, uh, left for Central Tibet in 1734, 
uh, the monastery no longer enjoyed the same degree of glory and uh, prosperity. So uh, uh, as soon as he left, uh, the bodyguard um, established to guard him was abolished. And so they only had a uh, um, uh, company um, from a company with only 30 soldiers uh, to uh, guard him. And then by imperial order, they established the monastery. They, the monastery, the scale of the monastery had been really scaled down. And, um, but there was a, um, a tradition that to since then, then Gata Monastery, the abbot of the Gata Monastery uh, was sent from the, uh, um, from the Jabon Monastery. And so that made it possible for the monastery to be still very active and very, uh, to be able to interfere in the local, um, uh, in the local affairs. So I'm going to go very quickly to, um, okay, I got stacked up. So um, uh, the, the one I mentioned that um, why it still enjoy uh, great power. Um, one of the incidents that the second reincarnated Lama, a guild of Chodra Jato, um, 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 abbot of the present day Nima Monster, Ogunu, uh, Gata Monster abbot actually issued an order forbidding in expansion and renovation of the Gunu Monastery. And so he even presents the monks under the uh, uh, under the Kunsan uh, uh, Chodro Jatsu. This reflects the power enjoyed by the Agatha Monastery and its abbot. And then also uh, in 1776, uh, uh, the Qing generals uh, suppressed the uh, Zanla Chuching uh, rebellion center uh, memorial reporting that the abbot of the Gata Monastery Angawang Daji, together with two of his disciples, had arrived to res, uh, uh, arrived to recite Buddhist scriptures in the military camps, and then the Qin generals held that the abbot and his entourage had um, offered to move in their monks to Chuchi and Zanla in an effort to propagate the Gelu teachings, but the Qin actually refused, uh, worrying that they would band together and they um, and they two places like Chuching and Zanla and uh, Gata uh, would naturally fall under the tradition. Uh, they, they were afraid that um, the Zanla and Chuching would fall, generally fall under the jurisdiction of the uh, Dalai Lama. And so they refused So you can see the influence of the Gata monastery in the region. I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to uh, go very uh, briefly uh, about, um, uh, let's see, oh, um, in, in my book, uh, in my uh, article, I mentioned all these frequent um, earthquakes. Um, and so um, in 1785, 1793, 1814, uh, 1812, 1893, because of the frequent, um, uh, frequent uh, earthquakes in the region, hastened the decline of the monastery, but renovations also show the degree of the importance, the Qing court and also the Tibetan government attached to the monastery. Every time when earthquake happened, they uh, were uh, renovated. And um, so um, you can see that it's been, um, so I think I'm going to move to the um, Gata incident. So during the Republican period, we still see that the monastery, um, I skipped some of the sections about um, the Gata monastery was accused by Jala King and the local um, <clears throat> and the local people of um, uh, seizing their uh, more uh, households and seizing their land uh, throughout the year, like especially in mid 19th century. So you can see that monks and the monastery uh, still played a very important role in regions uh, nearby. So the Gata um, incident, I think in, uh, in the study of Tibetan history, because it's overshadowed by the uh, Feng Chen incident. So we, we do not usually pay as much attention as we should have. This happened before the uh, Feng Chen incident. So in 1905, uh, when the um, Dajian Lu prefecture uh, established a gold mine, and so when they started to operate um, the uh, monks and abbot of the monastery actually stopped uh, uh, tried to stop the miners to do the gold mining because in the past the taxes were paid 
to the monastery uh, in secret. But now, uh, since it's uh, mining operated by the Dajian Lu subprefecture, so the monastery lost the uh, tax money. And so um, the, the skirmish occurred. And so a few uh, miners were killed. And then as usual, the chain sending <clears throat> troops, punitive troops against them. And then uh, the uh, officer uh, sent to suppressed it, it was also killed. So it became a huge, uh, quite a huge uh, disturbance. And so uh, with the help of the Jala Jabu, the uh, Minjun Tusu, they eventually were able to suppress it. And so um, uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, this, this was actually the very first uh, in the late Qing, uh, the conflict um, uh, or, um, between the monster and the Qing over the um, control over the uh, tax uh, or taxation of the uh, mines, and so I'm I'm, I'm going to very uh, go very briefly during the Republican period. You would still read that the monastery continued to be a culture center in northern Kham and the holy land for Tibetan Buddhist followers, and, and so local people still revered the uh, monastery because it's a resident monastery for the Dalai Lama. So you uh, in um, according to the sources I have in 1928. 200 monks reside at Gata Monastery. And um, this a sizable population that made it the second largest monastery. And then and you will see that in the abbot of the Gata Monastery in 1940, Kesan Doji, were elected councillor of a provincial uh, consultation bureau of Shikang province. In 1947, he was elected as members of Shikang People's Congress, uh, Shikang Goda Dai Biao. This action should fully reflect the importance of the monastery. And so I'm going to uh, go uh, jump to my uh, conclusion here. Um, <clears throat> um, very first one I want to emphasize here is that um, compared with the earlier scholarship, earlier uh, um, scholarship, usually we state that only in Tibetan imperial period or the fifth Dalai Lama's time, um, Central Tibet uh, had jurisdiction or had direct control over Kham, and the direct influence of uh, Central Tibet on Kham would have to wait until um, 80, 1865 when the Nyarung was established. But my study actually shows that <clears throat> based on the scattered um, <clears throat> sources, Tibetan Chinese also sources, um, Probably we had we had uh, misunderstood. Um, this was a misunderstanding or misconception. As my talk briefly showed that, uh, in fact, uh, between the fifth Dalai Lama's time and uh, uh, also the uh, Nyarong Jicho establishment of the Nyarong Jicho, the Gata Monastery actually played a very important role in the local affairs of Kham as well as. Um, uh, their relationship with both Qing and uh, Central Tibetan uh, uh, government. Uh, so, um, because the monastery uh, was the, um, it's the residence of the Samsa Dalai Lama, it was also um, like the only monastery in Tibet region established per imperial order, and it was special funds uh, allocated by the uh, Qing emperor. And as I mentioned, the 11th Dalai Lama was born there, so um, it became uh, recognition of its fame and uh, uh, prestige was not limited to come and other Tibetan areas in northern, uh, northwestern Sichuan. It also spread far and wide in central Tibet and other Tibetan regions. So uh, as you can see from my brief talk, Qing authority had always attached great importance to the monastery and always supported it by renovating it repeated, uh, repeatedly after it was uh, damaged in frequent early uh, earthquakes. And the Qing uh, did, did so, um, did this because in addition to the monastery's um, um, presti uh, prestigious religious status, Gata Monastery served an uh, important function of civilizing and enlightening the neighboring region, which were far away from the political uh, center. God has a strategic uh, location far away from central Tibet. And the fact that it was an important town firmly under Qing control made it an ideal choice to establish 
new uh, as a new resident monastery for the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama's triangle journal uh, 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 journey. In, in my paper, I traced um, his trip to Dege after he was uh, born, and to Dege and to um, Xining and Kumbong and to Central Tibet, and then to uh, to uh, Litang and Gata and back to Central Tibet. So you would see it looked like a triangle or journey. The trip from his birthplace Litang to Dege, from Dege to uh, Kokonor, from Kokonor to Central Tibet, from Central Tibet to Kam and back to Central Tibet actually expanded the scope of his religious activities. As I mentioned very briefly, um, there, there were full uh, many, many of the religious activities engaging both the local monasteries and the indigenous uh, chiefs. Um, um, so such travels actually enabled the Dalai Lama to be in contact with wide, a wide range of Mongol and Tibetan monks uh, as were uh, lay followers and greatly raised the religious prestige among these groups. Uh, furthermore, um, the Dalai Lama's um, <clears throat> um, seventh Dalai Lama's interaction with various indigenous leaders, local monasteries, um, um, also um, and lay people, uh, monastic and lay people, strengthened his relationship with them, and increased the influence of the uh, Gelu school uh, in Kham. Um, uh, Gata Monastery had become not only an important center for the Gelu school, but play a dominant role in inspiring indigenous chiefs to support the Dalai Lama. And seventh Dalai Lama's uh, residence in Gata, on the other hand, enabled the Qing court to move the military center of gravity from Huanlingping in Jiasangka and nowadays in um, Luding to Gata further uh, west. In addition, such measures uh, for protecting the Dalai Lama as stationary troops and inspecting mountain passes and checkpoints objectively strengthen the Qing court's control of Kham. Furthermore, the establishment of a special governor general for Sichuan in 1731 to deal with Tibetan affairs showed in the eyes of the Qing court the uh, vital supporting position of Sichuan and more specifically of Kham in administ uh, administering central Tibet. These developments affirmed present and later strategies are having to stabilize Kham first, so as to administer central Tibet and of consolidating Sichuan to protect central uh, Tibet. So, and finally, after the Dalai Lama left for Tibet in 1735, Gatara Monastery continued to serve as a culture center for Northern Kham and remained a holy place in the eyes of Tibetan Buddhist followers. Since the successive abbots of Gatara Monastery had been dispatched by Jebon Monastery until 1920, the influence of these abbots and their monks grew steadily over time and the subject under the uh, jurisdiction of the monastery increased. Uh, I didn't have time uh, in my talk to go into detail, but there are, uh, there are many, uh, both Chinese and Tibetan sources, uh, especially Chinese me uh, memorials sent by the uh, Sichuan governors uh, or the uh, generals uh, to complain about the interference of the uh, Gata uh, monastery. And the monastery had thus been able to influence, interfere, and control the local affairs of Gata and the other regions in Kham. In particular, in the late 19th and early 20th century, Gata Monastery, together with the Tibetan commissioner in Yarong, was able to assess the Tibetan government's efforts to extend its sphere of influence in Kham, uh, as we can see from the 1905 Gata incident. Um, we see that both the Qing court and the Lhasa government capitalized on the special situation of Gata Monastery. Um, I think I went over a little bit, and I think that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, you did so much. <laughs> it was masterful, and- uh, uh, I'm going to uh, stop it, okay. So, okay, uh, really wonderful to have all that detail going back in time and, and forward in time from the, from the time of the Seventh Dalai Lama. Thank you very much. It really, now that we know all this information, it just had me wondering how come we didn't know Gartar was so central before you came along, but that's that's how it is with your research. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, 
it reminds me of L.A. Sperling's work where you managed to bring together for these borderland places Tibetan sources and Chinese sources that complement each other in ways that let us see the, the bigger picture uh, and, and understand important places and people and so forth that, that we otherwise might miss if we just base ourselves on, you know, Tibetan sources that might emphasize Dege or uh, some of the important uh, Nyingma and Kagyu monasteries in Kham and, and or the Chinese sources, in, in which case we might pay attention just to the the Gelrong Wars or, you know, places like Dar Um So it's, it's really wonderful. Um, there, uh, I encourage everyone to put your questions in, in the Q&A section down below. I'll try to get through them. Um, Pamela Logan, who's done important work on helping restore uh, art and, and protect monasteries as, you know, I think going back to the 80s, certainly the 90s, um, asks, and I, this ties in well with the question I had, what were religion? What religions were prevalent in Gartar prior to the period of the Seventh Dalai Lama's arrival? Was it Ban or older orders of Buddhism? If the latter, why did the Kangxi Emperor favor the Galupa over others? And and I wondered whether, you know, it might. I mean, especially in light of that inscription where you kind of oppose the Fan Yi, you know, the the, uh, yeah. the calm Fan, you know, the calm Tibetans. Uh, to faraway Tibet, I, mean, I wondered what the term was there. Was it just Utsang or was it Chitsang probably? Um, and and talk about the Galupa. Essentially, I mean, they didn't use the word missionizing, but it sounds like um, this enlightening of this of these local Fanyi um, seems might be an effort uh, to disrupt uh, the Nyingma and Kagyu presence there. Does that does that make sense in knowing what you know? Yeah. Um, to be honest, we have very little sources uh, about the region. And that's why you say why we haven't to really pay attention to the area after I probe into it. Um, when I wrote to my, I mean, I'll go a, a little bit longer. Than, when I wrote to my um, uh, dissertation on Gombo Nangje, I did come across the passage. I, I didn't uh, have time to share with you. There was a passage that um, one of the uh, governors actually wrote to uh, emperor uh, saying that the abbot of the um, Gata monastery was uh, very uh, outrageous because he he actually uh, uh, actually a uh, Benguin, one of the two brothers in uh, uh, Benguin, who was the head of the lower Nyarung chief uh, who. Who was uh, who killed the uh, grandson, a uh, grandfather of Gombo and heard that the uh, emperor had forgiven the uh, Chuqing uh, chieftain, and so he actually went to see the abbot, saying, "Please uh, ask him to plead on his behalf." And so, so the governor actually was very surprised to read about this and said, "It's outrageous for." the abbot of the Gata Monastery to have so much influence in the region, even Benguin, you know, the, the very uh, uh, rebel in Yarong asked him to, uh, to intervene on behalf of him, with, uh, to plead with the emperor. So from that, I got a sense back then, it must be quite important. However, I was not able to really go deeper into it because that's the only source at the time I had access. And later, when I start to do field work in the region, and, and then I found more Chinese sources complaining about the uh, interference of the monastery. And then, as you said, combining with the Tibetan source, the biography of Seventh Dalai Lama, I think we have not used the biography well, good, uh, well enough. There, there are a wealth of information about his traveling, but because we're, we are uh, very few of us are familiar with the local places. So sometimes even when we read it, we won't be able to sense the importance of his interaction without knowing who he was dealing with. And, and so uh, in a sense, I think um, I have to be very honest, very little, uh, very few sources about the religious um, contour or landscape before the Gata, except when I look into the uh, history of Gata Monastery before it was established, 
there there uh, were some um, Nima and um, what do you call it like uh, that monastery is but for cave uh, meditation caves mm -hmm. and uh, as I mentioned here they have the cave of Varachana the Perutana but this one you know, you will find Perutana caves all over Jarum, all over these places. So I don't know how much we can read into it. And uh, when I did the photo work, I saw the ruins of a major monastery. But when I asked people, very few people knew what the monastery was. But my guess was that Nima and the Bembo, um, based on um, the monasteries uh, left in part of Minya, in, very close to Gata, um, the, there are uh, sizable Nima monasteries and some Bembo monasteries, e uh, even now, quite active. Um, but, uh, but I don't, um, my guess is they were not like the Gata, had the imperial support, had all this support from even Jala, Jala Jebu, Minjun Tusu. Later, of course, he was complaining that they took over too many of his households, but he voluntarily donated um, the um, uh, monasteries. So in that sense, I think the Gilu monasteries uh, compare with those minor, smaller uh, Nima and the Bembo monastery in terms of the skill, they were bigger. And for Nima, as we know, there were so many Nima monasteries in Kham, uh, uh, they were uh, branch monasteries of uh, uh, Gato or these, but they were much smaller scale and they were very much engaging with the local people, but not much, not as much with the indigenous chiefs, with all the uh, say political uh, players. And so for Bembo, um, mm, I think I did a little bit uh, research in when I did in Jarong, in, in, in Rongja or this area, Bembo Monastery and also my research in Nyarong. Bembo Monastery um, seemed to be more family-based. Yeah. Family-based, not as bigger scale, but they were there. Uh, like they were influential among the local people on, on uh, maybe daily basis. But for major, a bigger big picture, it seemed that Gelu monasteries became entrenched in the area and nearby, like in the, uh, as we know, uh, the uh, Batang, Litang, uh, uh, Nyachoka, all of them. And then we have, because of the, um, they, they usually refer to the uh, monasteries built by the Ngawang uh, Pento, the, uh, the uh, disciple of the fifth, fifth Star Lama. And that's when, uh, I think uh, Ho Jing uh, Awapenso, he established all these major monasteries. And that's, I think, the time when uh, Gelu became as prominent. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, one of our students here, Bhargavi Viswanath, uh, wanted to ask you about the um, Seventh Dalai Lama's exile as depicted in folk tales. And uh, Han Hanung Kim also wondered whether local people shared any kind of collective memory that dated back or that traced back that kind of memory of the relationship between Tibet and the Tang, as uh, you mentioned, the, the Gartar, you know, kind oh, of theory connection. Um, uh, that's actually uh, part, this part of my research set, in a way set apart from our earlier research is I I mean, in, in Kumbu Nanjie, I also tried to wave into the, all the folk tales or the construction images. And here, actually, when I did my field work and to, to dig into the origin, um, there, there are more folk tales, um, um, more, more folk tales circulating, like the Gata one, I think the old people, uh, but I'm not sure whether it's because it became a tourist site. Uh, when I went to, uh, so, so uh, uh, but you can see the impact of the tourism uh, industry. When I first went to uh, Gata, it's around uh, 2010, I was still in the States. So I went to do ferry work uh, uh, there. At the time, they were planning to turn the uh, Gata, the town of Gata, um, 
including the monastery. And uh, in, in the talk, I didn't have time going into it. In fact, on the opposite uh, side of the monastery, there or uh, there were there is a um, village uh, uh, inhabited by descendants of the Chinese soldiers who were sent to garrison the region, and so um, there um, at the time uh, uh, 2010 they were planning to establish as a tourist site, including both region, and so they were debating what to present to the tourist Gauta Monastery, of course, it's like a, a Gelu Monastery, uh, well known for the seventh Dalai Lama staying there and the, uh, its association with the 11th Dalai Lama. Um, uh, in, uh, in addition, um, they also um, said that the monastery, they can um, emphasize the influence of the, the impact of the Chinese architecture, combination, blending of Chinese and Tibetan styles. So it's a very good theme uh, for the uh, contemporary uh, publicity. But at the same time, they had a hard time to really, uh, how say, feature what Minya is. Because this region, uh, Gata region nowadays is considered to be a part of Minya. So they were trying to figure out what kind of culture, Minya culture, we should uh, present. And then they, and very few people can actually uh, answer what the Minya culture should be, different from uh, Kamba uh, culture. So um, in the beginning, they, um, I think they decided, in the end, they decided to uh, publicize the town as more of a, a um, unity town where the descendants of the Han Chinese uh, 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 guards uh, intermarried with the local people. And so they, they really um, built up the town and then they changed the uh, houses to make it look uniformly and the same, and then put up the red lanterns with the surnames of these people, all this. And so um, what I, I mean, because of the tourism, when I did my field work, many people, <laughs> They, 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 they are used to telling all these reporters or these outsiders about their um, like history. So I encountered many of the uh, elders, younger ones, they really pointed to um, saying, okay, this is, oh, this is where the uh, gardens that actually escaped. Uh, this is the uh, mountain. And then they also pointed to, this is the ruins of the gardens uh, uh, family. They claim that his family uh, home, original family home was there. So in terms of that, I think there are many uh, folk literatures um, in, in, in a way capitalized, or I don't know, <laughs> uh, to be useful for the uh, local people to project that image. Um, and so um, for others, um, in, in terms of their uh, memory of the Samson's dilemma, um, again, I can see it's, uh, the entire landscape is uh, full of all these memories. You, you, when I went to visit, uh, they will point to me. This is the um, this is the, what a uh, hot spring where the seventh uh, where where the eleventh Dalai Lama's uh, mother uh, like uh, based or all these. So a lot of hot spring, and then also uh, re residents of the eleventh Dalai Lama also became. Uh, local uh, attraction. So in that sense, you will find um, a lot of memories, but maybe overplayed in a way. Uh, so I don't know if I had gone earlier before this tourism uh, frenzy, so maybe it would be a different story. Uh, however, um, the memories of uh, both the um, like um, Seventh Dalai Lama and also even Wen Cheng Gongzhu is quite a lie uh, in, in Kam and in, in Lagang. And I think uh, Cameron Warner probably wrote about that as well. There was a statue uh, supposedly brought by Wen Cheng. And so um, one thing I think I can share is uh, I haven't um, finished my research about the folk, uh, the operas they perform in the monastery. I was told by my informants that um, when they um, performed uh, a Chang, 
the, the charm and, and all these religious dances, they actually, in the end, they incorporated somebody who represents uh, the, who presented as a Han Chinese playing uh, flute and who was considered to be the uh, protective deities uh, for the uh, Chinese descendants who live in uh, as the uh, uh, dissident, uh, uh, descendants, Chinese descendants of the uh, guards and who live in uh, in the uh, Gata town uh, right now. And so um, because I was running out of time, I didn't really go too much into the Republican period. Uh, during the Republican period, Gata became very important. Um, partly in 1937, uh, um, the Liang Hui's and uh, um, uh, and they actually decided to establish an experimental farm, which Mark Frank wrote about. And so uh, the status of Gata uh, was elevated to a region, sort of like a uh, settlement, but a region um, higher than township, but lower than uh, county. And then in 1947, it was uh, upgraded to a county, it's called the Channing County, Gata County. It existed until 1978. And when they abolished it. So, so this period of uh, Gata history, that's what I'm going to work on for my next project. It's very interesting. You would see different players uh, uh, in the field. You have um, and the warlords, uh, Liu Wenhui, you have abbots of the Gata monastery, then you have the um, magistrate of this county, uh, Gata, uh, Gata County. And um, I had sources saying the magistrate intermarried with the local Tibetans. And there were a lot of complaints about this magistrate uh, for cheating on the uh, taxes or, or a lot of lawsuits. So it's very interesting um, to see, to, to delve further into a Republican period. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, you have to let us know when you publish this paper, and then we'll send it out to the whole uh, list serve that we have. <laughs> uh, so I many emails. Uh, I submitted to a SOAS bulletin of SOAS. They have accepted, accepted, but I don't know when it's been okay. <laughs> quite totally. long, <laughs> two years, I think. Well, we'll, we'll know where to look for it. Um, <laughs> so the next question I wanted to get to is. Um, I'll try to combine some questions by two two graduate students here, here Peldon Gell and Tenzin Yewon Dongchong. Oh. Um, uh, so Peldon is wondering about the fact that the Qing court stopped the influence of Gartar and the Drepung sent abbots over the newly pacified and Galupa converted Gyalrong polities of uh -huh. Chu uh -huh. Do you think this yeah. indicates a jurisdictional conflict? Or is it because these polities were ruled by Qing magistrates? Um, or was it just to try to restrain Gandan Podrang's influence? And and the other kind of question that may be related is that uh, Yan Wang wanted to know, did the cosmopolitan encounters of the Gartar, at, at, that happened at Gartar during the exiled years with a number of inter-Asian visitors, Torga, Koshot, Halka, did it contribute uh -huh. to sustain connections between local elites and their Mongol counterparts? So it's kind of about the the larger connections outside of, you know, to, to the to Gyeongrong area, to the Mongol areas, uh, and and in relation to the Qing? Um, the very first one, I think because I was running out of time, so I didn't really uh, go into detail. So it's a very good question to allow me to uh, elaborate. Um, from the uh, Chinese sources, um, they, uh, they report that, I think uh, I'm trying to pull up the, um, what I have here, um, they actually specifically, uh, they, they um, let's see. Um, I think they actually said that they were afraid that if, if the abbot of the Gata monastery were allowed to go uh, to, go to uh, propagate or to teach Gelu, uh, like uh, Gelu teachings, in Chuqing and Zhangna, they were afraid that it, it, it would become under the jurisdiction of the Dalai Lama. So I think it's there, the element of, for fear that the Gandan Pujang's uh, influence will, um, uh, will uh, expand it into uh, the area. Um, and that's uh, one thing. 
But when they refused it, they did not say no directly. They just said, okay, these people, they were against, uh, they, they, they were the evil uh, monks who were engaging uh, um, uh, rebelling. And so uh, they were defeated. The monasteries were in ruin. So even if you, uh, if you send more monks into the Chuching or Dana area, there wouldn't be any monastery to house them. That's the uh, official um, uh, reason they gave. Uh, but I think they, they're afraid that it will expand the uh, Gandan Pujang or the Dalai Lama's uh, influence. That's very um, much clear in the writing itself in the, um, uh, in the Chinese uh, sources I have. Um, um, the second one, uh, what's the question? I forgot. You know, it's about the, the Mongols who came from, from far, far afield to meet. Oh, uh, um, mm, for that one, um, I, I think I read so much, as I mentioned, the Seventh Dynamics biography. We should have uh, people who are more familiar with Mongols to read more carefully. Because for me, I can only tell say Mongol, this prince, that prince, the right one, the <laughs> left one. So I'm not really uh, be the one, I, I'm not the one who like you or others who are really familiar with the uh, Coconut Ando area. So should read into that and and probably you will find a wealth of um, um, uh, information. I, I've tried to encourage my Ando friend, uh, Renchi Doma, I said, you should do it, you should do it. But she's uh, she's doing something about the Chahan Nomahan. She's busy with that. So, um, but it's very difficult for me to find the sources to allow me to trace whether any of the contacts has um, uh, has taken shape or have become a permanent tradition and to send continue to send uh, or continue to contact with Gata. Um, the sources probably, at least uh, right now, the sources um, would not allow me to really um, explore that end. So, um, but my guess is if we can find more biographies of the lamas or, or especially um, Dan Robes or um, say genealogy of these uh, chieftains or uh, these local chiefs or kings like we have the gay one we do we have money children but that's all and for for Jala Jebu we don't have and for many of the other major uh, chieftains very few or uh, Kansa we do have a later book about uh, Kansa and Jiangun um, but very few of them we really uh, have especially for Mongol one I don't know whether um we can um, find uh, sources to allow us to see whether any of the connections actually continued. Um, except some of them, uh, the connection he established, I didn't have time to go into detail in my talk, uh, is that his connection with the Litang Monastery it continued and Litang Monastery um, constantly sent people to uh, meet him when, while he was alive and also requested that the abbots of the Nitang Monastery should not be sent from central Tibet. And they made the argument that when the abbots left, they took all the possessions to central Tibet and then the monastery lost them. And so all these. And then um, uh, his also uh, his connection with uh, um, one of the Nima, I think, uh, monastery, it seemed to uh, be very strong. He granted the uh, Lama with the title of, uh, I think, Shabbat. Uh, one of the four shabbats, he had a, a chingyi, he had a, a writing document to certify that. So you will see that. Um, also his connection, or oh, um, I think one sense I, I get is that because he was, he was in the income, he was closer to all these troubles as well. So uh, when uh, the infamous uh, Sanye, when people complain about Sanye, he actually intervened and he wrote to the Sangye, uh, um, like, uh, rulers of Sangye saying, you should take care of the bandits thing. But it didn't work as we expected, but uh, in any event, he intervened. So it's very interesting. I think the idea, I think what I get from this, uh, my research is that because of his exile, he was able to really reach out to many more 
um, people and many more monasteries than he was able to do if he was just in Bodala. I mean, there would be some indigenous chiefs or major chiefs or monastery monks, lamas who would go to pay homage, but not to that extent. And so I think this is uh, something um, maybe your student, if they have enough sources, they can really go um, dig further into it. Like what uh, Curtis did with the fifth Dalai Lama, I think the seventh Dalai Lama's biography. There are so many informations for people if they are interested in gifts, <laughs> exchange all these tons of information, what things were given and or, uh, on what occasion. And so it's very, um, I think your student probably will be the one who can uh, dig further. But at least um, the, the part of his travel uh, when he was escorted to um, from Dege to uh, Kokono area, a lot of description of who came to see him, what gifts presented, and what kind of contact he had in Gumbong and in all this. So I think it's it, it should be a very a good source material, uh, primary source for um, any of your student to explore, to see at the time who were in power or who were influential uh, for the Mongol prince uh, or, or this, even the lamas, yeah, the um, uh, Tibetan lamas who were uh, influential in the area. And that you can probably figure out the network itself. I think it's, uh, but for me now, I can't really uh, answer. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. It is, it, it's important for people to know that, you know, that, that, that source is now available in Chinese and Tibetan so that if you don't know Chinese or if you, I mean, if you, you can kind of use those things to refer to each other. You can figure out the Chinese characters from the Tibetan and, and vice versa. Um, yeah, yeah. Again. And there's a, a translation of the Seventh Dalai Lama's uh, biography by a scholar uh, yeah. uh, from Pumwen Chen uh, from yeah. Qinghai. Um, it, it, it's very, it's quite accurate in terms of uh, content, but the uh, places you need to identify yourself because usually uh, they, they sometimes he does identify the place in the footnote, but a lot of times because he's from under, he's not familiar with Kam, so he will not do the same. But I, I wish or I hoped <laughs> he would have done some identification of the. Uh, and those side, and then I will have a better <laughs> idea of what, what went on. But at least it's a good place to start. I think he did the uh, pioneer job, you know, to figure out uh, the basic contents and then give me a clue saying where to look. And so I, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we're we're pretty much out of time. There's so many more questions. Uh, a lot of people were asking. Kind of along the lines of the earlier question about the oral history, and maybe also about the other histories, like how how much can we trust them? How much do, or do we think they're accurate? Of course, these are all tough historiographic questions that that you know we could we could argue about <laughs> for a long <laughs> time. I mean, these these are hagiographies, the Galupa hagiographies. Yeah, there are questions. Um, that, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Um, when I I got a comment from one of the reviewers saying that I'm privileging all the gay resources, but so so I have to acknowledge when I revise it, saying that I'm forced to uh, to privilege the sources because that's the only sources available to me. Uh, but but I try to also get a hold of the other version of the Seventh Dalai Lama's biography published in exile and it's the author was not given it's anonymous so i've tried to compare them um, i can i i found out a lot of uh, core parts were similar so my guess is no matter who wrote it uh, either uh, uh janja Rubidoji or the anonymous author they they had a core like record list of his activities to work with. So in a way, I try to mitigate the Geluba reading or the Qing reading, because I use a lot of uh, official records. But um, also how, uh, I think it's hard to say how much we can trust. I think um, 
when I when I talk about this uh, at the Columbia one, I think uh, Professor Sorensen also asked saying these are uh, these are not just uh, not historical, but but I I think that even if it's not historical, but maybe we can use this to reflect the people's memory of the area, perception of later people, yeah, perception of the region. So I think the. Uh, maybe instead of Hanyang, whether it's true or not, but maybe to look at saying why, why certain folk tales, certain legends are, are, are prevalent in these regions, and uh, how, uh, how, uh, like, what does, uh, what do these folk tales tell us about people's sense of identity and also place? So maybe that's one way to deal with this. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you again, Lauren. <laughs> sent out the okay. um, the link if you want to register for future events, and also uh, Idris almost talk will be posted soon, so that you can catch up with all the details if it went to went by too fast. <laughs> thank you so much again yeah, thank you. for yeah. your time and all your research. Yeah, sure. thanks. It's nice to see you uh, virtually. Yeah, I haven't seen you for a long time. And thank all of the listeners. And also, um, I, I also thank you and Lori and Julie to make this possible. <laughs> it's a challenge in a way. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Bye bye. Okay, bye.